So, why have I chosen to bring you into a reasonably sunny but rather cold sheep shed on a Saturday afternoon as a way of starting off our stuff for Sunday morning? Um, <coughs> really, because I wanted to show you one of these. Uh, this is the, uh, the adopter front of uh, a sheep pen we use at lambing time in this shed. And uh, we'd rather not ever have to use it, but sometimes we do. It's better if we didn't, but we do. Uh, we use it when there's been a, a big problem of some sort or another with a ewe or a lamb. And uh, what we do when there's a, a ewe that hasn't got any milk for its lamb to save the lamb's life, we might find another ewe that perhaps hasn't had a lamb or something's gone wrong, maybe she's lost a lamb. And uh, we, put the, we put the ewe in here. And there's a reason for that. We, uh, we want to keep the, the little lamb that's viable and uh, the ewe has milk. And that ewe, which perhaps isn't raising a lamb of its own or could take another one because you've got a lot of milk on only one lamb, uh, she's going to save the life. She's going to save the life of that little lamb. And so uh, we, uh, we bring her into this pen and we put a bucket in front of her. She puts her head through here. And then uh, before she knows what's happening, uh, we close this lever and her head is here. And uh, she can stand still and feed the lamb. And the reason we have to do that is that you can't reason with her. Uh, you can't say, now listen, if, if you'd just be a good girl, um, we're going to put this extra lamb on you, or this somebody else's lamb on you, and you're going to feed it, and that's going to be good. She can't hear that. If you put another lamb in with a ewe, the ewe will probably batter that lamb, and it won't be good for the lamb. At the very best, it won't be good. She'll refuse to help, she will refuse to feed it, she'll be cruel to it, she may kill it. She'll be hostile. <coughs> So we put her head in here for a few days, let her out a couple of times a day, having removed the lamb with the pen next door. And uh, after a while, that lamb becomes acceptable to her. And when that lamb's acceptable to her, it's fine. We can just let her out and let it run and take it out the field and let it go again. Not a problem. But she won't accept it because it's not hers. It's not acceptable to her. It doesn't smell like it. It's not hers. And so we have to go to these lengths to save the life of that lamb, to keep that little lamb safe from the, from the mother, from the ewe that's going to be the source of its, uh, its salvation, its, its, its hope of life, really, altogether. The scripture says to us about the Lord Jesus that he doesn't have that attitude at all. The scripture says that uh, to those who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, husband's will, but born of God. That's the verse we're looking at today. And this example maybe points a few of the contrasts for us between God and his approach. To adopting us to be his children and the things we sort of more commonly see in the world around us today. children in the world the world dressed white man's terms the way I see there ain't much difference the bulls are swimmers in the world of me so the big word of the day today is adoption but it's advent it's Christmas what what can that possibly have to do with Christmas? John tells us it has everything to do with Christmas, as the purpose for which God's Son, the Lord Jesus, came into the world at that first Christmas. He, the eternal creator God, came to that which was his own, his own stuff that he had made. And here's what happened next. He came to that which was his own, 
but his own people did not receive him. But to all who have received him, to those who believed in his name, he has given the right to become God's children. Children not born by human parents, not by human desire or a husband's decision, but born of God. As if the person we've offended over decades, the person we've offended the very most over a protracted period of time, not only took the initiative to come to you, that's Christmas, not only took the initiative to pay off the debt that you and I owed, that's Easter, but also adopted us into their family, wrote us into the will. And what a will it is. John talks about two things in this passage of scripture in his prologue in John 1, 11 and 12. John talks about Christ's rejection and he talks about Christ's reception. Now, with human adoption, with sheep adoption, we've been looking at that, it's so often a matter of whether the adoptive parent will adopt the child. You get those young kids, don't you, in children's homes, making those heart-rending little videos, trying to show that they'd be a wonderful child to adopt trying to get acceptance with prospective adoptive parents. Pick me videos. Well, that's not the way it is with God. It's the other way around. The boot is on completely the other foot. It is we, those who need family, who have first of all rejected him. Firstly then, John deals with rejection. He, that is the Lord Jesus, the eternal creator God, as we've seen in, the, in what goes before in John's Gospel. He was rejected by his own. His own. His own property, his own home. That new to noun there, Aista uh, idia eilthen. He came to that which was his own. It can refer to your own possessions, to your home, to your homeland, as it does in Thucydides. But this fuller expression Ace ta idia, always, both in the Septuagint, that's the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and also in the New Testament, means to one's homeland. His homeland is what rejected him. He came to that which was his own. But his own people did not receive him. Subtle irony here. When the Logos, the Word, came into the world, he came to his own, ta idia, and his own people, hoi idioi, who should above all others have known and received him, they did not. The prophet, you see, was utterly without honour in his own country, amongst his own people. In the words of Isaiah, in, in Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected, and we esteemed him not. Here's a big, big problem for, for the early church. They're trying to communicate to the world in which they're set that the Messiah, God's appointed saviour, has come. But he's been rejected. How can that be? And John taps into a long tradition in Old Testament prophecy, in Isaiah and in Jeremiah, the great 8th century BC prophets, prophesying that God would send his son, that God would come, himself would come, to his own, and they would reject him. Now, in a hospitality-based, in a clan-based, in a family-based culture, this is a terrible thing. This is awful. It's a disgrace. It's a terrible thing to be unreceived amongst your own people, in your own country. But his own people didn't receive him. Hoidioi is masculine, it must be understood as speaking about his own people. They did not receive him. Not even the barest hospitality was extended to him. And that's dreadful. They would not accept him. 
It's not an idea of mere recognition here. It's the idea of acceptance and welcome, which is missing. And repeatedly under the Old Covenant, the prophet spoke, as in Isaiah 65, 2 to 3, of this particular problem. I spread out my hands all day long to my rebellious people, who've lived in a way that is morally unacceptable, who did what they desired. These people continually and blatantly offend me as they sacrifice in their sacred orchards and burn incense on brick altars. And then verse 5 of Isaiah 65, They say, keep to yourself. Don't get near me, for I am holier than thou. These people who are doing such awful things and rejecting God himself in the way that they are, they, they're claiming to be above reproach themselves. These people, says God, are like smoke in my nostrils, like a fire that keeps burning all day long. That's a theme that will get picked up, enlarged on throughout John's Gospel. But it's been drawn from, as I said, those... 8th century Old Testament prophets. Jeremiah 7 picks up the same theme again. Jeremiah 7.25 From the time your ancestors departed the land of Egypt until now, I sent my servants, the prophets, to you again and again, day after day. But your ancestors did not listen to me or pay attention to me. They, be they became obstinate, were more wicked than even their own forefathers. And God then says to Jeremiah, I will send you to these people. Tell them this. I'm sending you to them and they will refuse me and they will not listen. They've not accepted correction. He's blinded their eyes, hardened their heart, so that they would not see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn to me and I would heal them, says John in chapter 12 of this gospel. Isaiah, John goes on, said these things because he saw Christ's glory and spoke about him. These people hardened their hearts. They entrenched within their own personalities their rejection of God. And the rejection of God sets like concrete the point where you're unable to undo it. A judicial hardening takes place. Like that in the days of the exile, the diaspora spoken about by the Old Testament prophets. Such a time has come upon the land, says John. But there is a remnant by grace. He came to that which was his own. His own would not receive him. But, against that background of those whose rejection of God is set like concrete, in verse 12 John goes on to talk about reception. He's talked about rejection and it's a terrible prospect. Then he goes on to talk about reception in verse 12. But to all who received him, those who believed in his name, he has given the right to become God's children. John's emphasis is so much more positive than Jeremiah's, isn't it? Jeremiah was called to hold out truth to a people who would be recalcitrant, determined in their rejection. But John is written expressly, chapter 20 of John tells us, written expressly so that you might believe and that by believing you might have life in his name. And yet the coming of the king to his kingdom also entails a judicial prophetic hardening of those who would despise and reject him. But to all who have received him, those who believed in his name, he has given the right to become God's children. Many people have pointed out that his own did not receive him. It works pretty well as a working title for the first 12 chapters of John's Gospel. It's about those who did not receive in those first 12 chapters, but then from chapter 13 to 21, you could equally put over that the heading, but to all who have received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Again, the prologue to John is like the preface, telling you what's coming in the rest of the book. This is an interesting little thing. To 
all who have received him, who believed in his name. Hossa de Elabon Autar. <clears throat> Elabon is a definite act in past time, it's a perfect tense. A definite act in past time with abiding, with continuing results. Something happened at a point. These people believed in his name. They put their faith in Christ. Deliberate past time event. Those who received him, and they're to be understood as those who believe in his name. First of all, two things. <clears throat> receiving him and who. It's crucial in John's Gospel that when the eternal creator son comes, that we should have received him as such. It's crucial for salvation. This is the criterion for having or not having eternal life throughout John. To have received him. Have you, by deliberate determinate act, a definite act in past time, with abiding and continuing results for the way that the rest of your life has gone, have you received him? Because that's the criterion for having life from this Jesus. Have you received him? How do I know whether I've received him? How, will I, how can I answer a question like that? It seems almost presumptuous in some people's way of thinking. Well, John tells you, so you need presume no more. How do I know that I've received him? Well, another way of describing those who've received him, the eternal divine word, is to say, says John, that they have believed in his name. Now, that's not a simple mental ascent. There's a Greek construction here, Pistorian Ace, and what it means is to have put your trust in him. To have taken your little life, such as it is, and to have trusted God with it. Put it in his hands. To live it out as he leads and guides. To do as he directs. Entrusted to him. It's the opposite of self-reliance. It's God-reliance. With all that we have and are. Which people received him and believed in his name are we talking about here? All of them. Jose de Alabon Auton. All who received him. It's very interesting in, in John's Gospel that we go on from this point to the story quite soon of Nicodemus in chapter 3. And Nicodemus is the height, the picture of religious respectability. He is the guy who is learned in the law. He is uh, the, the Pharisee of all Pharisees. He is the guy who has uh, studied the law and is on top of it and lives a very regulated life in the religious fashion of the day. And Jesus says to him, you need to be born again. Now there's good evidence that perhaps later on in his life, Nicodemus gets right with God. But immediately from that point, we go to a different individual, a different character altogether. Jesus goes down to Samaria and there beside a well, Jacob's well, there in the middle of the day he finds a woman who has had a number of husbands. And as Jesus says to her, yeah, and the husband you've got now, the man you're with now, he's not your husband, is he? And it seems she's coming out to that well in the middle of the day because her life has not been acceptable, even to the people amongst whom she lives. She's not acceptable, you see. To all who receive him. Regardless of background, regardless of spiritual religious achievement, however you want to conceive of that. To all who received him. Who put their trust in him. Entrusted their life into his hand. Believed in his name. To those, all of them, regardless. He gave the right to become God's children. It's a complete contrast in terms of people and backgrounds to whom the gospel is offered in these early chapters of John. Why? Because the blessing of the gospel that we're about to examine is to all who received him, to all who believed in his name. So secondly here, please note this. It's not just whomsoever. But whomsoever meets this criterion, they've believed in his name. They have believed in his name.
his name. It's not simply an intellectual ascent that we're talking about. It's an entrusting of one's life. A taking God at his word and trusting him to make that okay for the whole of our life. Well then, to those who entrusted themselves to him, put their trust in him, he gave. He gave the right to become God's children. The right. Not having to go on trying to win acceptance and favour. But the right has been given to become God's children. This is no grudging thing. This is no some paper adoption. The right to sonship a place in the family is conveyed. What John says here is huge. How can this come about? It's an obvious question, one that, uh, well, trips up the learned theologian Nicodemus, as we've already seen in John chapter 3. Jesus turns to him and he says, Nicodemus, there's no hope for you, unless you're going to become born again as a child of God. Unless you're going to lay aside your self-reliance and your religious works and your legal obligations and, and, and trying to win acceptance. You need to be born again. All over. The way Jeremiah spoke about God in the future time, as far as Jeremiah was concerned, giving his people a new heart, taking away their heart of stone that had been hardened in rejection against God and giving them a heart of flesh that fell. A new life. <clears throat> God's children. Verse 13 says, Not born by human parents or by human desire or a husband's decision, but born of God. Spiritual new birth. And as we prepare for Christmas and the coming of Christ the King, let's revisit the question this poses to us. What do we call people to? When we call people to follow Christ, we call people to new birth, into a new family, to be the newborn people of God. Those who receive the word are identical with those who believe in his name and they are identical with those who are born of God. Here's what it takes. We stop rejecting. We receive all that he is. Accept him as he is. Take him at his word as we put our trust in him and rely on him to deal with every consequence that arises. This Christmas, where are you on this one? Are you with those who reject Christ and his claims upon you? Or are you with those who gladly accept the coming of the King and prepared to trust him to live with the consequences of believing who he is what he says, and entrusting ourselves to him. Have a great Christmas. It's privilege. It's potentially immense. Face of